Hello, and welcome back to Faith Bible Institute here at Faith Baptist Church as we continue our study uh, of the Old Testament, an Old Testament survey. And for several weeks now, we've been looking at the minor prophets. And today, we are up to the prophet Nahum. And so, again, not a very long book, uh, three chapters only uh, in the prophet Nahum, but uh, again, packed with information, with, in, with world, ch literally, world-changing events. Uh, again, there's nothing minor about these prophets, okay? They're, they discuss all kinds of uh, major and significant events and truths um, that, again, we today still need to understand and, uh, and take to heart. So, before we begin our study today, let's look to the Lord and ask His blessing upon this time together. All right. Heavenly Father, we want to thank You, Lord God, for the, the wonderful truths that we find in Your Word we thank you, Lord, that you have preserved your word over these many centuries and that your word is eternal and unchanging uh, and that the, its truths are every bit as applicable today as when they were first written. And so, Lord, again, we pray, Father, that not only would you help us understand uh, the principles that are contained in your word, but that, Lord, truly these principles would speak to our hearts, mold our hearts, Help our hearts to be more uh, like unto yours, Father. And uh, so bless this study today. Again, may this be a very um, helpful, profitable time that we spend studying uh, this uh, another minor prophet in the Old Testament. And so we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So uh, as we begin with an introduction looking at the author whose name again Nahum means comfort or consolation and uh, Nahum is only mentioned in this book don't find any reference to him outside of this particular book um, probably he's from southern Judah although some think that since the city of Capernaum actually means city of Nahum uh, some think that that used to be his city of Elkosh as is ind indicated in um, Nahum chapter 1, verse 1, and then it was renamed to Capernaum in honor of this prophet, but that's unsure. So we're not exactly sure where the city was located, uh, but perhaps it, it was the former, it was the city that was called Elkosh before it became Capernaum. At any rate, Nahum prophesied in the 7th century, uh, probably around 660 BC, at a time when Assyria was at the peak of its prosperity and power. Uh, under the king Ashurbanipal. The destruction of Samaria by the Assyrians had already taken place in 722 B.C. But in Nahum chapter 3, verses 8 to 10, we find a reference to the fall of Thebes, the city of Thebes in Egypt, which we know took place in 664 B.C., and Nahum refers to that as a recent event. So, more than likely, Nahum wrote this book shortly after the fall of Thebes, so somewhere around 660 B.C. And he talks primarily about the destruction of Nineveh by the Babylonians, and that destruction would take place eventually then in 612 B.C. The theme of the book uh, pretty much is, ex is uh, expressed in Nahum chapter 1, verse 9, which says, What do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. So, uh, this verse, Nahum 1 9, highlights the imminence of God's retribution against the wickedness of Nineveh. Nineveh's judgment, Nineveh's judgment is, has become irreversible. And so, it's decreed by the righteous God who will no longer delay his wrath against Assyria's arrogance and cruelty. And even though, again, this was at the moment of Assyria's zenith, okay, the, the height of its power, um, all of her power will be useless against the mighty hand of God. Now, it's, the historical background is incredibly important here because we just studied Jonah a couple weeks ago. And as I'm sure you remember, Jonah was sent to the city of Nineveh about 100 years prior to this, in 760 B.C., to warn the Ninevites uh, 
of the impending judgment that God was going to bring upon the country at that time. And because of the repentance shown by the entire city, from the king all the way down to the least of the people in the city, um, just a, a fantastic revival that took place, God withheld the judgment that was going to come at the time of Jonah. Now, a hundred years have gone by, and now Nahum is, uh, is proclaiming the imminent destruction of Nineveh once again. Nineveh was indeed an impregnable fortress. If you think of some of the statistics that they've learned from their you know, archaeological discoveries, um, Nineveh was surrounded by walls that were 100 feet high, fortified with 200 towers that rose another 100 feet above the wall. <laughs> uh, it was encircled by a moat that was 150 feet wide and 60 feet deep. And so the Ninevites thought that their city was invincible. In fact, the city was built to withstand a 20-year siege, if you can imagine. And, um, and yet, 100 years after Jonah's remarkable revival, the people of Nineveh had returned to their defiant, uh, rebellious, immoral ways. And so Nahum's message is not a call to repentance, as was Jonah's, but rather a decree of certain death for a people who had worn out, so to speak, the patience of God. And so as, un as unlikely as Nineveh's overthrow seemed to, well, everyone, okay, because this was the dominant power of the time, okay, the Assyrian Empire dominated the, the known world. And, uh, and its power was known to everyone. And so it seemed incredible to think that this empire and the cities, especially of Nineveh, could be overthrown. Yet in spite of all, all of that, Nahum's prophecy that no trace of Nineveh would remain was fulfilled exactly in painful detail as he describes. Indeed, after Nineveh's destruction in 612 B.C., the site of the city was not even discovered until 1842 by some archaeologists. Incredible. So, considering um, some of the key verses of this book, uh, two verses, especially com coming from chapter 1, chapter 1, verse 3, that says, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. Wow, this is these two attributes of God that are in this perfect balance. Uh, the Lord is slow to anger, and yet he will not at all acquit the wicked. And we're going to come back to that thought later on. How God can be slow to anger, he can be both slow to anger, and yet not acquit the wicked. Um, and then the other verse from uh, chapter 1, verse 15, Behold, on the mountains the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace. And that verse probably sounds a little familiar because it's uh, stated in other places in the Bible, notably in Romans chapter 10. And we're going to go back and talk about that later also. Let's move on then to some of the main points of the book of Nahum. Um, so there's three chapters of this book, and each chapter basically is its own unit. Um, so chapter 1, we see the destruction of Nineveh decreed. Then we'll see chapter 2 will be the destruction of Nineveh described. And chapter 3, the destruction of Nineveh deserved. But let's look here first of all. Chapter 1, the destruction of Nineveh decreed. And so we see in the very first verses, chapter 1, verses 1 to 8, the, um, as Nahum lays out the general principles of divine judgment. And these first eight verses portray the patience, the power, the holiness, and the justice of God. Indeed, God is slow to wrath, but he settles in full when his patience comes to an end. Look at verses uh, 2 and 3. Chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. 
the Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. So uh, Nahum starts out by kind of reviewing who God is and again this perfect balance that we find in the principles of divine judgment. Then uh, in the latter part of chapter 1, Nineveh, uh, again, states this decree of the destruction of Nineveh and along with the corollary is the deliverance of Judah. That is, Judah benefits from the fact that Assyria will be destroyed. Um, Verse 9, we read, What do ye imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. Okay, so again, this is not an invitation to repentance. This is not a statement that God might still have mercy. This is a statement of uh, absolute, it's a decree of absolute judgment. That is, God's patience has come to an end uh, concerning the Assyrians and the Ninevites themselves. Going to chapter 2, second part uh, of uh, of this small book, we see the destruction of Nineveh described. And so in chapter 2, the first couple of verses are kind of a call to battle. And then starting in verse 3 and following, <clears throat> a more detailed explanation of the destruction of Nineveh, the city of Nineveh itself. So we see, for example, in verse number 8, it says, But Nineveh is of old like a pool of water, yet shall they flee away. Stand, stand shall they cry, but none shall look back. And then look uh, at verse number 13. Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will burn her chariots in the smoke, and the sword shall devour thy young lions, and I will cut off thy prey from the earth, and the voice of thy messengers shall no more be heard. And so there's quite a bit of detail in chapter 2, chapter 3, describing the utter destruction of Nineveh. And what's fascinating is that the uh, many details of Nineveh's destruction that are given uh, by Nahum have been verified by archaeology and as well as other historical accounts. So again, there's really no question about what actually happened to Nineveh. The fascinating part is that Nahum had prophesied what would happen at least about 50 years before the actual event. And then we get to chapter 3, and chapter 3 um, is the destruction of Nineveh deserved. So it kind of gives the reasons why God's patience has come to an end. And again, uh, the Assyrians were well known for their violence, for their cruelty. And uh, so God kind of rehearses that. And so in verses chapter 3, verses 1 to 11, we have the reasons for its destruction, highlighting Nineveh's great ungodliness. If I just read verses 4 and 5, chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, because of the multitude of of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts. Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will discover thy skirts upon thy face, and I will show the nations thy nakedness and the kingdoms thy shame. And I will cast abominable filth upon thee and make thee vile and will set thee as a gazing stock. So God explains, uh, summarizes uh, just the, the, the wickedness of the Assyrian Empire and uh, the fact that the, the judgment was well-deserved that would come upon Nineveh. Uh, verse, chapter 3, verses 8 to 11, there's then a comparison between Nineveh and, as I mentioned earlier, how the city of Thebes is discussed in chapter 3, um, the destruction of the city of Thebes in Egypt, And so Nahum makes kind of a comparison between what's going to happen to Nineveh as compared to what just happened recently to this important city of Thebes in Egypt. And then chapter 3 ends with uh, a statement that this destruction that's being decreed by Nahum, by God, is indeed inevitable. And so verse 18, um, as we close the book, it says, Thy shepherds slumber... O king of Assyria, thy nobles shall dwell in the dust. Thy people is scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathereth them. And so God says, 
this is what's going to happen. There will be no reversal. There will be no um, uh, last moment deliverance that's going to take place. So there's kind of an outlay of the book. Um, let's look at some important truths that we find in this book. And so first of all, as we've already, already referenced, 100 years prior to this, Jonah had been sent by God to warn the Ninevites of God's judgment. And thankfully at that time they did repent. Um, but now 100 years later, their wickedness is so great that God now moves Nahum to pronounce this uh, imminent judgment upon the city of Nineveh. And so it's interesting to contrast the two books and their two messages, Jonah and Nahum. So we see that Jonah highlighted above all the mercy of God, while Nahum highlights the judgment of God. See the dates there where Jonah preached around 760 BC, whereas Nahum preached about 660 BC, about 100 years between the two. In Jonah, we see the repentance of Nineveh. In Nahum, we see the rebellion of Nineveh. In Jonah, there's emphasis on the prophet, while in Nahum, there's emphasis on the prophecy. In Jonah, we see a disobedient prophet, but an obedient nation, whereas in Nahum, we see an obedient prophet, but a disobedient nation. And then finally, in Jonah, there was this very unlikely, yet complete revival that took place among the Assyrians. Whereas in Nahum, we see this also very unlikely, yet complete destruction of this impregnable city of Nineveh. So a very interesting contrast, very instructive contrast between these two books. Another important truth to consider is that while God is indeed eminently patient, even God's patience will one day come to an end. We see this pattern, in fact, throughout the Bible. And I think it's really helpful and instructive to take a few minutes to uh, kind of summarize different instances in the Bible where we see God's patience so wonderfully displayed. Starting, for example, all the way back in the book of Genesis, chapter 15, God makes a statement to Abraham concerning the people of the Amorites. And notice what he says in Genesis 15, verse 16. God says, But in the fourth generation, uh, your people, that is uh, Abraham's descendants, shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So the Amorites who lived in the promised land, in the land of Canaan, uh, would eventually be judged primarily by the people of Israel. But God says, not right away, uh, because their sin is not yet full. Now, God made this statement to Abraham, but then allowed about 500 years to pass before finally bringing judgment upon the Amorites. 500 years. God waited and allowed the Amorites the opportunity to repent, which they didn't. Uh, another group where we see God's patience is the Israelites themselves, especially the northern kingdom, because all of the kings of the northern kingdom of Israel, all of them, were idolatrous and wicked men. You can read their biographies, so to speak, and uh, in the books of Kings and Chronicles. And yet God waited over 200 years before bringing destruction upon them. And that was after he sent you know, numerous prophets and numerous messages of warning. And yet God still waited over 200 years before he finally brought judgment upon uh, Israel, the northern kingdom, and the city of Samaria. The Ninevites, as we've just been discussing, God, God accomplished these unheard of miracles through Jonah. I mean, from the storm and the ship on the sea to the big fish that swallowed up Jonah um, to the revival itself. But, you know, these unheard of things that took place simply so that the Ninevites might hear this message, this call to repentance, and that they might be forgiven, which they were. But here, 100 years later, they have returned to their sin, returned to their violence, their immorality, their witchcraft, etc. And, uh, and yet, God waited 100 years before he brought this judgment upon them. And then one other group, as I call the Americanites. 
Yeah. So how about us? A country that slaughters innocent children in the womb by the millions. And that legally since 1973. That a country that has held gay pride parades in its major cities for the last 50 years. Gay pride parades for the last 50 years. A country that says churches should close during this pandemic since we are non-essential, while stating that abortion clinics and liquor stores should remain open. A country that has begun to openly punish Christian business owners who refuse to compromise their biblically-based values concerning sexuality and marriage. And the list could go on. And so the question is not, will judgment come upon America? The question really is, when will it come? And again, we do see God's patience to these different nations, the Amorites, the Israelites, the Ninevites, and God has been very patient with us. But how long? How long will he be patient? There's an important text in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, that reminds us again why God is so patient. And it says here in 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but he is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So God makes this, he explains why he waits 500 years for the Amorites, why he waits 200 years for the Israelites, why he's waited now decades and longer for the Americanites. He explains why he's so patient with us. He says because he's not willing that any should perish, but he desires that all should come to repentance. He gives men and women the opportunity, countless opportunities, to turn to him to be saved. And for him to show his mercy, just like he did upon Nineveh under the preaching of Jonah. But the next verse in 2 Peter 3, after it says, The Lord's not slack concerning his promise, but he's patient toward us. The verse 10 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Hmm. So judgment becomes inevitable and inescapable. It became inescapable for each of these nations before us. Because there comes a time when the sins of every people are complete. And the patience of God is exhausted. And so judgment falls. And so really the question is, where does that leave us as a nation? Where do we stand in God's timeline? Because judgment will come. The question just is when. And are we preparing ourselves, are our hearts prepared to meet God? Have we repented of our sins? Are we seeking to honor God and to live for Him? Let's, we'll talk about that in just a minute here. So let's move on to discuss, um, we always have two key questions we like to uh, include in these studies. One is, what teachings about Jesus do we find in these books? Because the Bible says, Jesus says that all the prophets wrote of Him. And so what do we find in Nahum concerning uh, the Lord Jesus? And so, first of all, we see in chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, it says, Who can stand before his indignation, and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. So, wow, what a... What an interesting contrast between verses 6 and 7, right? But verse 6, when you read the words there, who can stand before his indignation, who can abide in the fierceness of his anger, etc., and that the rocks shall be poured down by him, it is very reminiscent of what we read in Revelation uh, concerning the, coming, the second coming of Christ. And so in Revelation uh, chapter 6, verses 15 and 17, it talks about uh, the wrath of, of the Lamb of God when He comes back and how the even the greats of the earth are going to ask for the, the mountains to fall upon them. Let me just read uh, Revelation 6, verses 15 to 17. The kings of the earth, 
the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, the mighty men, every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Wow, I mean, almost word for word from what we read in Nahum. Um, also, again, in Revelation chapter 19, when it describes the exact moment of the second coming of Christ in glory and power. In Revelation 19, verse 15, we read this, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So these verses in Revelation truly echo the stern warning that we find in Nahum chapter 1, verse 6. But it's interesting, Nahum 1, verse 7 then says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. So indeed, uh, verse 7 reminds us just how good our Lord and Savior is and that he knows all those who trust in him. So in spite of the prevailing wickedness around us in any nation, God knows those who are his. He knows those individuals who have trusted in him, who are seeking to live godly lives before him. And God will, he knows them and he will bless them and he will keep them and he will save them. So Nahum 1, 6-7 a very interesting connection with Christ and his second coming. Nahum chapter 1, verse 15, we read this. Behold, upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings and that publisheth peace. As we mentioned earlier, this verse is quoted several times in the Bible. We find it in Isaiah chapter 52. I'd like to read it here. Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 7. It says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publish, publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. So the same words as in Nahum, just a little bit longer, more developed thought. And then, especially when we go to Romans chapter 10, the New Testament, Romans chapter 10 and verse 15, and notice what it says here, as Paul is writing, and he quotes now from the Old Testament, he says, And how shall they preach except they be sent, as it is written, and undoubtedly he's referring to both Isaiah and Nahum, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And so um, Paul makes this, uh, makes this allusion to this, uh, statement made in Nahum and in Isaiah, but applies it to the gospel of Christ. So we're referring to this good news that's being preached, these good tidings that are being given, and the blessing upon the feet of those who publish these good, this good news. He, Paul carefully applies that to the gospel of Christ, the message of salvation in Jesus Christ. So yes, Christ is certainly uh, referred to in the book of Nahum, and uh, next, though, we would like to consider what lessons there are for us to take away from this book. And again, there are certainly numerous lessons, but let me just highlight a couple. First of all, again, although, as we've seen, God is incredibly patient, we must be very careful and be aware that we must not presume upon God's grace. We must not presume upon God's grace. In the Old Testament, the book of Numbers the Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. Um, another verse that we find in uh, the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, verse 10, that says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to what he hath done, whether it be good or or bad. We'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We must not forget that. Or again in Hebrews chapter 3, notice this uh, exhortation that is given in Hebrews chapter 3, starting at verse 12. It says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, 
Harden not your hearts as in the provocation. So we must not presume against God's grace. Today, as you hear God's voice speaking through His Word, every time you read the Word, every time you hear preaching of His Word at church or on the radio, we need to be sensitive to God's voice. We need to be careful to not harden our hearts, to turn our ears away from God's Word. We must not presume upon God's grace uh, because we will stand before God and we will give account one day. Another important truth, another important lesson for us is this verse in Nahum that we just read a little bit ago that's also stated in Romans. God states repeatedly in the Bible how beautiful to Him are the feet upon the mountains of those who preach the gospel. And it's kind of a curious phrase that's used both in, um, uh, that's used in uh, Isaiah and then again here in Nahum, it talks about the feet of those upon the mountains. It's kind of a why upon the mountains. And uh, one commentator wrote it this way, God looks especially favorably upon those who have such a burden and love for lost souls that they are willing to scale and overcome obstructing mountains. That is, they are willing to overcome their fear, their timidity, as well as the social barriers that have been erected against the very idea of witnessing at work, uh, in your neighborhood. Um, you know, there's fewer and fewer places where it's acceptable to talk about God. And this verse is saying that God finds the feet of those especially beautiful who are willing to overcome those mountains, overcome those obstacles, in order to share the good news of Jesus Christ with a very lost and a clearly dying world. And so what a special blessing and encouragement for us to take the gospel in spite of the barriers that are there, in spite of our own um, hesitations and, and, and timidity, etc., and to boldly and faithfully preach the gospel to all those people around us who do not know him as their Savior, who are headed to hell if someone does not warn them and tell them of the love of God for their lost soul. So, to conclude, as is becoming more and more evident, there is nothing minor about the minor prophets, okay? Uh, their message is major in every way. In fact, may we catch the burden and the fire of these minor prophets in our service for God and in our witness to the lost. So I want to thank you again uh, for joining us for these studies I trust that they're a blessing and a help to you, an encouragement. And so again today, let's look to the Lord and ask Him to now apply these truths to our hearts and so move in our hearts that we would be changed by what He tells us in His Word. So let's pray. Lord God, we do want to thank You, Father, uh, for Your incredible patience toward us toward the lost in general, but even to us as your children, you still are very patient with us, Father, as you mold us and, and allow us to grow uh, step by step, day by day. But Lord, at the same time, we, we, we cannot, we must not presume upon your grace, upon your patience. Uh, Lord, we are accountable and we will give account one day. And in the meantime, the days are fleeting by. And so, Lord, you ask us to redeem the time. Um, the days are evil, the people around us are dying, even in this pandemic, but at all times, people are dying, and, uh, and many without Christ, some without ever, ever heard of the, uh, the gospel of Christ. And you place upon us this responsibility and this ministry of reconciliation. And then you say, Lord, that when we take this to heart, and we actually do go forward, we go out to share the good news with others, Lord, you say that our feet are beautiful for doing that. And so, God, again, may all this encourage us to stand firmly upon your word, to proclaim your word with confidence and compassion. And, Lord, may we, serve, may we seek to serve you this week um, with faithfulness, uh, with zeal, and uh, in seeking, Lord, to honor you above all things. So may you work in each of our hearts, Father, to accomplish your perfect will in us and through us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you so much. God bless you.